Hi, everyone. This is Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo. And I've got some friends here, and we're going to try out um, something with you, uh, which is called Purpose to Practice. Purpose to Practice is a liberating structure that we'd like to show you. But we'd also like to show you the idea of collaboratively developing participation guidelines with students. And so this is sort of a meta type of thing. It's a two in one, right? It's, it's both uh, emphasizing the importance of developing these guidelines, which sometimes faculty write in their syllabus, but we think maybe you want to also consider um, developing it with your students or revising it with your students in the middle of the semester. Um, and that's the link to the liberating structure, which we'll share with you in a slide later. But before I think, you know, the people I've got with me here are educators, right? So pretend they're students for today <laughs> and pretend I'm their teacher. Um, and, you know, I'm going to start out by asking, have you ever seen community guidelines, codes of conduct, and etiquette, participation guidelines, and things like that? And I would probably ask that question ahead of time, that if they have them, they can bring the links with them. And this is actually what did happen today, is before we went live, I asked them if they had some in mind. So what I'm going to do is, I'm still sharing the screen, um, but um, I'm going to ask who wants to, you know, I'll share the screen, but just tell me who wants to go first explaining the one that they gave me. So I have three. I have one from Mia, one from Ken, and one from um, Rissa. Well, I can mention the one that, um, that I had mentioned earlier, which is right, um, in the development of our experience with Mozilla Foundation, when we were um, building out um, equity, equity and value for the first mm -hmm. time, um, mm -hmm. they had brought up this idea of community participation guidelines. Um, in essence, it's, it's just a sort of um, contract that you lay out in the beginning that indicates what is appropriate behavior, what might be um, disruptive or difficult behavior. And um, yeah, so in a, uh, I think- so there are two, by the way. This one is the festival, but there's community participation guidelines, so we can open those. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones you want, right? Yeah, um, I think we were inspired by these guidelines. Um, we felt mm -hmm. that they really hit upon a lot of things that were thoughtful in making mm -hmm. sure everyone um, felt invited into the space and that they, um, in essence, were meant to be there. Um, we felt like this was really well thought out and that it seemed to be something that a lot of people contributed to in mm -hmm. order to get it right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just showing some of the things that have mm -hmm. over here. I'm just going to read some out loud in case someone um, has a visual disability or something. So some of these things mm -hmm. are like being respectful, um, you know, expected behavior, being respectful, direct, or professional, inclusive, and they lay out, you know, things like uh, being inclusive of people who are joining remotely or people who are not native language speakers or come from different culture or prefer pronouns other than he or she and time zones and facing any kind of challenge to participate. So these are nice because they lay out specific things, which I think sometimes when we talk about diversity, we miss some of these. Um, and something about understanding different perspectives, appreciating accommodating similarities and differences, leading by example. And then they also have behavior that will not be tolerated, like violence and threats of violence, personal attacks, derogatory language with very specific ideas of how you might do that, unwelcome sexual attention, physical contact, disruptive behavior, influencing unacceptable behavior and then consequences right so not just what you can't do but this is what's going to happen and reporting like how would you report it if someone does that and you know what happened in the events and, and all kinds of other stuff over here. so this actually makes me think of the one that ken um had shared ken do you want to talk about this one a little bit sure so um i was looking for a different one but i found this one because i was thinking about conferences um and in particular uh, i know open ed had a code of conduct i didn't go mm -hmm. to that one this, mm -hmm. this group probably knows it. So this is the RSA conference. And looking at Mozilla, one thing I really liked about the Mozilla example was much more detailed and, and much more detailed about what to do right. Whereas this one, I mean, the acceptable behavior is, is kind of like, I guess the obvious, but sometimes the obvious isn't so obvious, mm -hmm. but it's, it's rather vague. Whereas the Mozilla one is in much more detail that you should um, consciously try to include people in conversations, which is something right. that we talk about often. Whereas this one, it, it's very brief. The I mean, even their acceptable behavior, like just refraining, goes from deme refraining from demeaning is one of the acceptable behaviors. Right. <laughs> like you think that would be the unacceptable I, behaviors. And I don't like the word Positive refraining behavior. either. It's kind of like, yeah, yeah, we wouldn't like you to do this, but it's okay if you do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so, okay if you watch someone else do it. Yeah. So um, 
I, it, it's, so it's a good a start, event I think, and it's a good example because I, I don't think it's enough. Um, mm -hmm. And it does go into um, consequences, but it's very vague on our little light on that. So I really like the Mozilla example. Of and they're this. very, uh, because I think maybe because this one's also about an event. So there are like particular things like smoking and vaping and alcoholic beverages right. and things. Yeah, I mean, I guess you, if you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, you never actually explicitly tell the students you can't bring drugs into the classroom, but you're sort of assuming. And, and I've been thinking that I, I, I need to do this for my classes. And I like that this example shows the uh, on-person, in-person event as well as a virtual event. Yeah, happened. I like that So too. we should be thinking about that as well. I love that too. So I mean, there, there are pros and cons. Um, it's, it's, I think mm -hmm. it's useful. And I think it's interesting because they're both tech organizations. So Mozilla is a very culturally sensitive tech organization and very social justice oriented. And so they're much more woke in terms of ex making explicit things related to gender and sexuality and, and race and culture and all of that than a regular tech conference normally would be expected to. Marissa, you were showing us this one, and this is for online education success. So that's actually the most um, similar to what we're trying to build here. Right, but it's the most vague and the least um, helpful probably, <laughs> which okay. is quite okay. something because the Mozilla, I really like the way the Mozilla one laid out what acceptable behavior is and what unacceptable behavior and the consequences. Mm. And mm. that this is just like, hey, here's some thoughts about how you would possibly conduct yourself. So it's real, it's, it's a little, it's maybe specific in the thoughts, but it's not very helpful in terms of if you don't obey these, you know, this is, this is what it looks like and how it'll mm -hmm. happen. Um, but I think that for me, that kind of works because I'm real context dependent and who knows if mm -hmm. you, I mean, I, I hate the word obey, but if you, if you violated, oh, of, um, yeah. what, what I might have a conversation with you mm -hmm. as opposed to being like, now you're going to be penalized. Um, so, um, I mean, you know. it's got some good ones. So, I, I mean, obviously, it's called netiquette, which is a very old term, and I don't like the word etiquette because of it just conveys superficial surface mannerisms that are not really, you know, soul deep. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, it's also and, rooted in a sexist culture of, um, you know, the girls' um, manners and, you know, yeah. the Pretty ladies' grace. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. I mean, yeah. overall, yeah. But, um, but the actual things in it are okay. Like for someone who's never learned online before, uh, it's right. useful. Some of the things like review what you wrote and try to interpret it objectively, like things about like the caps and the not using caps. If you wouldn't say it face to face, don't say it online. This is something people forget all the time on social media, right? Right. Um, and don't assume everyone understands where you're coming from. I think this one's really important. Like I was having a side conversation with someone who's with the five of us in a or in another situation, um, and saying, "I know this thing about that person, and that's why I'm reacting to them in that way." But other people don't know that, so they won't understand why I'm reacting to that. So that's important. Don't spam. Use the emoticons. Just the other day, I was with um, Meita Ahmed, and we were talking about how emojis make a huge difference. And the younger generation know that, but we sometimes forget to use them. It makes a huge difference. Like you want to joke, or you want to, you know, wink. It adds another you know. layer of, of yeah. meaning to yeah. the yeah. expression yeah. of communication. Another dimension, right? It adds Respecting some of that. Privacy. That uh, physical, you know, you what what is it? Ninety eight percent of what you say, or ninety percent of what you say, is actually when the face to face conversation is not verbal. Yeah. So it adds some of that not verbal back. Yeah. yeah. So if you're doing a lot of asynchronous, this is really important. Right? Asynchronous text based communication. People forget that. Yeah. And then I mean, this other thing, like if it's on the internet, it's everywhere, and, and realizing what you shouldn't share. So that's kind of a digital citizenship angle. Especially if your students are working in the open, these are things to keep in mind, right? So there's the funny one of follow the rules. This is about academic integrity, actually. And again, we assume that students know what we mean by that, uh, but you might mean it in a different way in your class than other people do. But I like this forgive and forget one. <laughs> you know, assume that you've misunderstood someone's intentions. That's really nice. You know, and talk to them, like figure out a way um, whether it's going to be the teacher doing it or the students doing it. So thank you for sharing these. I think it's useful to, to look at them as examples. Um, maybe you as a teacher, if you've seen one before that you liked, uh, you could share it. 
Uh, I've actually never done this, but I feel like I have to do it this semester. I do do some, I do other things, like I show them a video by Jay Smooth, I think his name is Jay Smooth, about um, how to tell someone they're a racist. You guys know that video? We have it on our Equity Unbound site. Anyway, it's how to tell someone they're a racist by focusing on their behavior and not generalizing about them as being racist. But you can say this behavior was racist, so stop doing this behavior, which is okay. But if you uh, address the person directly as their personhood, uh, it becomes, uh, they get defensive and they find all these different excuses. So I, I talk to my students about this because we have a lot of conversations about controversial things. And I just want them to call people out on things they've said or done, not generalize about them, oh, you're a sexist person or you're a whatever person. It's just like this thing you said is problematic because. Um, but that's, but I, you know, that was in face to face. And I think online it could get even worse if you're not careful about these things, especially if it's in writing, you know. So anyway, so. Uh, so if we were uh, right now in a situation where you all are students and I'm, um, uh, I'm the teacher, what I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you to use the purpose of practice uh, to develop guidelines for our class at the beginning of the semester. And then we're going to revise these after a month or so to see if they're working for us, if there's something we need to add. So we could start out working on them now, but then we can end up in a Google Doc later. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna show this text over here. And just before we get into it, I just wanted to know, because Autumn hasn't contributed a particular uh, code of conduct, but she might have like a, like a thought on this and the terminologies, right? Like we're using, people say community guidelines, codes of conduct, netiquette. I like participation guidelines. Um, Autumn, do you have any comments before we move forward? Um, I'm not a huge fan of netiquette because of the drawing on like older ideas of etiquette, mismanners kind of stuff. It feels very antiquated and, and mm -hmm. just kind of, I don't know, I think it sort of misses the point. I like both the words participation as well as community. Um, and I like, I like guidelines because this is messy, right? We're talking about the way that people are going to behave together in an environment and that's never going to be, or, or if you, if you make it like really hard rules or if you make it laws, right? Um, I just think that that's not conducive of creating community. And so something like guidelines or benchmarks or something like that, I like too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm not necessarily, I, I guess I'm, I have a hard line against netiquette, not really feeling <laughs> that one, but mm -hmm. either uh, community or participation and guidelines is a good one too. Mm -hmm. So Codes of conduct also feels like too dry, I think, but I don't like that one too much. I don't yeah. like the term code because I think mm -hmm. it suggests right. um, in and out understanding of something and then a kind of definitive contract. Um, yeah. But at any rate, I think you said quite a bit that was made sense, Autumn, in regards to breaking down the choices here. Okay. And so I'm going to move on to this purpose to practice approach, right? So this actually uses two liberating structures on top of each other. The first one is going to feel familiar to a lot of educators, which is one, two, four, all. This is a little bit like think, fair, share. But think, fair, share is usually done on uh, like a like when you're just doing a quick activity versus for this one, it's an, it's, you keep iterating on this one, two, four, all. In a face-to-face -face environment, you think alone, think in a pair, share in a group of four, and which would be your table or something, and then share with everyone else later. But for this one, um, when you do it online, the two and the four gets tricky. So you can either do it in ones and pairs and then all, or in ones and fours and then all. And I would usually do the fours because that way you get like more people participating in the idea of forming. And if someone drops off because of their internet connection, you don't end up with someone alone. So I would usually do it one for all. Um, and so what we're gonna do is normally you would send students in groups of four into breakout rooms to work on this. Uh, but for this one today, there's just us and we can just do it together. Uh, in the room, I'm just gonna stop as each maybe do um, a timing thing, just letting people know it's time to move on to the next step, right? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about these four things. The first one is principles. What rules must we absolutely obey to, to succeed in achieving our purpose, which our purpose is uh, community guidelines that ensure everyone's safety 
or something like that. We can name it, like maybe we can talk about how, what is our purpose, right? Like what, what would be a good name for that? But for just today, just to save time, let's say community guidelines that ensure um, a safe online environment. Is that good for everyone? Safe and engaging maybe both. And then the second one, participants, who can contribute to achieving our purpose and must be included. And then structure, how must we organize both macro and micro structures and distribute control to achieve our purpose. And then practices, what are we gonna do? What will we offer to our, in this case, students, but in this case, this is students talking to each other anyway, right? And how will they do it? Um, so in this case, it's actually students developing guidelines for students. But if we were educators, trying to develop this for Equity Unbound, maybe with the students not with us, uh, we could do it, but it would feel like when we go to this participants one, we'd say, oh, actually students should be included, right? So if we're trying to do this for Equity Unbound, the, the five of us um, are involved in Equity Unbound in some way or another, not all of us to the, to the same degree, uh, and we have open participants who are just other educators and we have our own students. So let's just try to imagine that that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to be very specific about equity and bound specifically. Um, but knowing that we're missing some people in this conversation, we probably need to do it again once we do have students. But I, I wouldn't feel comfortable recording it with students. Okay, don't worry about these right now. We can come back to them again if you've forgotten what they are. Um, so I've, I've created two virtual uh, visual uh, sort of notice boards that we can use. Jamboard is a Google thing that we can use that's free use just you know just like most google apps are um, and basically what you would uh, be doing here is that the teacher would set up the space and then i could zoom into one of these principles or rules what would, must we absolutely obey to achieve um, a purpose i'm just gonna zoom out again uh, and then what would happen here is that maybe like each one of you would take a sticky note um, here's a sticky note and type something in it. This kind of gets a little bit annoying because you get into the technicalities of doing this, but it does help to have it visually so that each person can type on their own and then we group them together. So you type your ideas here and then when we agree on certain ideas, we put them over here. You know, we move them from the individual to the group. And then if you have larger groups, then you mix them up together. So you go through like the principles question and then after five minutes, the participants question, after five minutes, the structure question, that kind of thing. All right, so that's one way. Um, another thing that's actually kind of cool to use is uh, Mural. If you've never used Mural before, I just discovered it uh, during the pandemic. It's a really, really nice visual tool, but it takes it has a little bit of a learning curve. It's a, but it's a lot smoother to use than, uh, than Jamboard, but again, it's the same idea of you know you have sticky notes and my idea here and then your idea here you know and then you think about them on your own and then maybe you can make space on the right hand side to just decide what are the final ones we're keeping you can either discard old ones merge ideas together that kind of thing but the the the, the cool thing is because you can for both of these because you can zoom in you can just focus on your own idea, even though we're all in the same space. But you can focus on typing in your own idea without being distracted too much by what other people are typing. Um, and you can add new sticky notes if there aren't enough for what you want to do. So that's that's one way of doing it. Obviously, you can just actually just you know create uh, a few more uh, just a few more slides on your slide deck, you know, and just use that. Uh, so, what would you guys like to do? Do you want to do it on, on one of these tools or shall we just use a slide for each thing? I love those tools. I, I would be into trying one of them. Maybe yeah. um, Jamboard. I don't know. Jamboard? Sure. What do you guys think? Okay. That Let's sounds good. Jamboard. We can move the sticky already around. logged in. Okay. Oh, right. Have I, you, you, yeah, I've already shared it. Have I shared it with you? Yeah, I've already shared it with you. Great. Yeah, I'm the so, pie. You can see. I'm the like, pie I'm not pie. So All right. So I, really missed it. I didn't know how to draw a line, so I just did this squiggly thing. So nice. basically, I think it's just pretty easy. You just pick a sticky note and write something. Okay, just so you can pick a color, obviously. So I'll just let you guys, what I'm going to do now is 
just remind you of the first step of the process and give you like, I'm gonna give you less time than you should have just so that we can finish the video. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing is what principles do we have? do we need to have in mind so that we would achieve our purpose? So if each of you would write one principle on per sticky note um, and put those over there and I'm just gonna keep the screen open for like three minutes and then I'm gonna stop you from doing individually and ask you to discuss it for three minutes, okay? I'm really sorry, I do not have the link. That's okay, it's, I'll put it for you in the chat. Can I ask a, a purpose? My email. Can I ask something about the yes. question? Yes, yes, go on. Um, what are we, what, what, can you give an example of what a rule would be in this context? Um, I, I, I don't like the word rule. I think principle. I don't either. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, I would say principle, like principles is actually clearer than what rules must we absolutely obey to achieve okay. our purpose. What, like, are our what, is, what are our principles? What are our guiding principles? What are the okay. values? Yeah. Makes I mean, you sense. can tell, you can sort of tell from the difference between the cybersecurity one and the, the Mozilla one, that their principles were different. That's why their practices were different, right? Like what they thought about was what, right. they, were, what they thought they were trying to achieve was completely different. In that sense. So I'm, I'm going to back to here. Just, okay, you're all in. I can see, you can see their pictures over here. Uh, so now I know everybody's in here. And I'm just gonna be quiet as to teach, sure. I think we're just making copies of these. Today we were doing something like this in my department when I kept doing rainbow colors and everyone was like, it's so disorganized. And I was like, but when they're all the same color, that's really difficult to differentiate them from each other. I wanna find mine. So. So, I mean, like as the teacher now, I'm gonna just zoom into this one. Intentionally Echo Hospitality, yay. <laughs> um, so for people who don't, like, I'm the teacher, I shouldn't be talking, but I'm talking to the people who are watching right now. Um, intentionally Equitable Hospitality is something that um, those of us in Virtually Connecting have, have been writing about and practicing as much as we can, which is how do you ensure that your online spaces uh, are hospitable to those farthest from justice. So you're not just making sure that everyone is treated equally. You're trying to make sure that those who are usually on the other end of equity get prioritized. And you're intentional about how you do it because if you don't do it intentionally, it's not gonna happen on its own. And Ken is posting stuff in the wrong place. So if I'm the teacher and I'm looking at the board and where it's going, I might just go to the breakout room and tell them, oh, you're posting things in the wrong place. Uh, but I think he was just writing it to leave space for others. So by waiting, yeah, I, I was trying yeah, to move I off the side. Opportunity to, yeah, he was trying to make room. So normally I'd let them go for a few minutes from this. I'm going to zoom in and see what and just zoom in. The zoom seems backward to me with my mouse wheel. Just something strange. Okay, so here's someone. So always be respectful, extend yourself to different perspective, be patient, practice this before speaking. So those, for example, I'm just going to say this as I look at them. Always be respectful is fine, but this be patient, practice this thing before speaking. These are practices and not principles, I think. Mm. Okay. I don't know what you Good guys point. think. Um, and Good then point. before you speak, think if it would be better to give someone else. That's again, that's a practice, not a principle. Yeah. I think intentionally equitable hospitality is a principle. Right. which you might need to lay out if you were in a student space where not everyone really knows what the heck that is. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah. So what I we would normally everyone did. do. Say what? I figured everyone did. Didn't know what it was? Well, yeah. Everyone here does. Everyone here does, yeah. Right, everyone yeah. here does, but my students yeah. wouldn't. Right, yeah. right. So that you could unpack that into several other principles, right? I think that's, right. that's what I'm trying to It'd say. It'd be nice if it was a card that flipped over and we can have... Oh, I like that very much. So what you would be doing is students would work on these on, on their own, and then you would ask them in groups of four to discuss them and come up with ones. Now, I think when you come up with something like be patient, da, 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 take it to the practices for now, but you need to later be able to 
connect them to your principles, right? Um, so you need to revise them again as you get there because what ends up happening, I think, is maybe people think about collaboratively developing a code of conduct with students, but they start with the practices. And then when you do that, you might miss out on certain principles and then you'll find it missing in your practice. Hmm. So, um, I wonder if some people are better at doing the thinking bottom up versus top down too, Maha. So maybe mm -hmm. coming from both angles is useful. That's very interesting. Um, I don't know. I'm just, you know, my, my software engineering background of thinking bottom up or top down is mm -hmm. shining. Well, it's interesting because you're also making me think about instructional design that usually starts with outcomes, yeah. which I don't like. I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, I develop my courses starting with my values. And th right. this does exist. These are process oriented and critical curricula. You start with your values and then you design your content and your behavior and everything around your values, not around your outcomes. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, who, who gets to decide what the outcomes are? But when you're explicit about your values, when you're explicit about those values, that are, there are values even when you put outcomes there, but you're, they're, they're not transparent. Right, and sometimes we're not explicit. Yeah. And I love that you said that. Yeah. So let me zoom in again. Um, I randomly chose pink, but I guess I was right because it was a practice. Huh. There you go. <laughs> That's so funny, yeah. I, I'm going <laughs> to say I meant to do that. <laughs> 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 I like the agency aspect, collaborative orientation. I think that could be a principle. Always be respectful, extend yourself to different perspectives. Okay. So, so look, just to, just to, because of time, normally I would give you time to discuss this amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think for just the purposes of the video, let's just move on. Uh, and you so guys type. Yeah, go ahead. You want to what what would be the so what would be the goal of doing that time? Would it be to maybe perhaps split some out or merge some or what would be the goal for that? Yeah, time yeah, agree, exercise? agree on the ones that you all agree, and then you'd move them to the bottom after the groups, of course. You could just move the ones that you all agree okay. on. Okay. Okay. So like let's all agree that intentionally I lost line. So we just move it here, or we just make a call duplicate. And move it down. One of the funny things that happens when you have students working in different groups but seeing each other's work is that occasionally after the four talk someone likes something that another group did and they just take it and I always tell them make a duplicate of it don't just take it without permit you know don't just take someone else's idea make a copy of it and move it down so that they can still find theirs. Um, I like the point about mechanics though, Maha, because some students might be staring at it, figuring out how do I make a new sticky note and I just grabbed mm -hmm. one and made a copy, it was much easier. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I don't like about using these tools is that people can be uncomfortable with learning the new tool. And this is already mm -hmm. an uncomfortable type of um, exercise and I don't want to do that. Uh, but some people really enjoy it too. So it's one of those tricky situations. You could do it on just Google Slides and just give everyone you know, I'm just going to show how that would look, but we're not going to do it. But like, we could just say Ken, and then Ken will write his, Mia will write hers, Autumn will write hers, and Brissa will write hers, right? Yeah. And then as a teacher, it's actually going to be easy for me to see who did, who said what, who contributed what, and then all yeah. four of us agree that, you know? I like this Jamboard thing where it kind of like put our pictures on it for a second there and yeah, I can, see you can zoom typing. in and zoom out and kind of just yeah. participate without typing. Um, hmm. I really, I didn't know that Jamboard existed. I didn't realize Neither it did was I a till Google today. thing. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> it came up in a tweet earlier from Brian Bennett and I just tagged you, Maha, about the other one you shared. Oh, you're for, all? Yeah, he was looking for an alternative to something else and someone suggested yeah. this one. Uh huh. But the, the thing with mural and mural, so there's mural as in like a mural on the on the wall, and miro, m i r o, um, and those two, I think they're not free for a lot. Of, a lot of it is not free. Okay. So that's, he was looking that's for alternatives to pad. This one's free. 
Oh, yeah, but the, the thing with Padlet that the Padlet has that this tool doesn't have, is that Padlet has upvoting and stars yeah. and ratings it's community and comments. Type stuff. Yeah, so it's not just about a post it mm -hmm. more than that. So I think it's important to, but it has all kinds of privacy issues, I think. Yeah. And it also, the free version also limits you to, I think, three others or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what happens with this is because you can see the four different things, people will jump to different steps of it. And liberating structures intend to structure things a little bit to ensure something that hopefully is a good outcome. So you really do want to ask people to try to stay within the structure and then you time it and then you make sure that you move fast enough so that people don't get bored with one step. So when we go, like if we're talking about equity and bound here and we're talking about who can contribute to achieving our purpose and must be included, um, I'm supposed to be the teacher, but I'm just going to contribute. Um, I'm going to say uh, students in our classes should contribute to this one. Oh, it's huge. I didn't mean to make it that big. And then someone said, all oh, people should feel safe to participate. But it's not about participating in general who, I guess maybe can, I might contribute to the, even the guidelines that we're trying to do for our purpose, which is creating a safe environment, right? Like we're trying to develop community guidelines to develop, uh, to have a safe online environment. And so what are, who needs to be part of that decision-making process? Not just the five of us, right? When you say all people, I think that's a very, I understand where you're coming from, but you need to name them because I'm sure you don't mean my husband or my daughter. I think they could, but I don't think that's what you mean. I think you well, mean a occurs, stakeholder. Yeah, go ahead. It occurs to me, Maha, you say like, I'm supposed to be the teacher, but I'm going to contribute anyway. I think the teacher has to contribute at some point. I think there's a mm -hmm. point where you need to sort of relinquish power and authority and let students, but I mean, you're still the power and authority in that classroom. And so I do think that you need to, like, if somebody suggests something that's really problematic, like, yeah, you, you need to be the one who kind of steps in um, and takes that burden off of students and trying yeah. to, you know, right. hash that. I mean, like, it's wonderful to say, like, oh, that's a democratic process and we're going to, but that's mm -hmm. a huge burden to put onto students yeah. to say that yeah. they would you know, step in if, if somebody did suggest something that was really problematic. So that would be one that I would put under, right. the, under the who is also the instructor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. And because this you give them confidence that you're going to step in for them. Right. And I was talking to Ramey about this when we were doing the video for the annotating the syllabus, is that a student's suggestion for changing something in the syllabus could exert power that privileges them and disadvantages other people. Right, yeah. and so I was saying, how do you deal with that? And he said, sometimes I deal with it publicly, sometimes privately with that student, and we talk about how does your comment affect other people. And another thing that I was thinking about is that um, when when there are things that people like, if you're a group of four and two of you think something is important, two of you think there isn't, how do we decide together? You know, sometimes like imagine like me and I was telling you about my colleague who likes the word netiquette. And I have more power than she does. And so sometimes I just step back and say, okay, fine, use it, you know? But it could have been a situation where I say, well, no, I, what I say is going to go, right? Um, and so if my boss was trying to work that out, there's a power imbalance. And I, I just realized I didn't spend a lot of time explaining to her why not, I just let it go. But it could have been one of those things where you could have a conversation about it, but would, would someone just give in? Um, and giving in as sometimes a way of being, um, just, I was trying to be helpful by just not exerting too much power. But in another situation, I could have been exerting power. She could have stepped back because of my power in that situation. So, it, mm, so students, students have power too, right? And it occurs to me, this is why that middle revisiting of these guidelines in the middle of the semester is so important. Because if mm -hmm. something does yeah. sneak through, <laughs> that's yeah. problematic. Right. At least you get that or, chance to kind of yeah. revisit it. Or it sounds good. On, or it sounds good in theory, but when you apply it, it doesn't right. work out, right? Or it doesn't. It's you find out that you're missing a group that you didn't mm -hmm. realize. Like thinking about, for example, I was talking to one of the, the people from our Office of Student Wellbeing, and she was talking about inclusive accessibility of all the different activities that we talk about. Um, 
And you know, if you don't have a blind student in your class and your class is not accessible to blind students, you won't realize. It won't be a big problem. But once you have one, you do need to do something about it. You should have, you should keep it in mind anyway, but definitely when you have one, it's a whole other ball game, right? Like I put alt text, for example, to all my pictures and whatever, but there might be other things that I don't know that I need to do. But as soon as I have a student who's blind, then I, I will have to be very aware of all those things and I might discover new things, right? That's why thinking of this as a living document that is mm -hmm. um, a participatory context for that lived knowledge is an important thing. Um, yeah. You know, and that's why the term terminology code um, or language like contract is mm. problematic because mm. it, it makes it a fixed thing that yeah. like stands and then becomes the reference point like a mountain um, <laughs> rather than a kind of fluid thing that is negotiated over time and that everyone is learning with as the thing is de in development um, and then has iterational um, editing moments. Yeah. I love that point, Mia. Uh, yeah, I like the iterational editing because I was just thinking this could be really context dependent depending on what you're doing oh, yeah. in that particular moment. So mm -hmm. you might want to revisit this every time you do something that's different. You know, you set up this for like the codes of conduct, mm -hmm. not codes of conduct. We just said we didn't like mm -hmm. that. Sorry. The mm -hmm. participation guidelines of, um, mm -hmm. you know, being in discussion forums or I don't like discussion forums, but being in Slack back channels or whatever, but then right. maybe there's something different for um, how you're going to go about doing your blogs or having classroom discussions or being in groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. It could be something we look back yeah. at often during the class and say, well, let's go see what our document says and if it needs updating. Yeah. As, as you were talking about that, it made me try to think Speaking of context, going back to equity unbound specifically, and openness maybe is a principle, right? Oh, I like that. that we feel is important to it. And because yeah. someone over here in the structures talked about collaboration and, and where everyone can contribute, and we have that in equity unbound, but I think we can do it better. I don't think our practices meet our purposes. So this is a purpose to practice, right? Like, go back to what your purpose is, look at your practices. Are they meeting? Are you getting there? Um, and I think we have a process, but it might not be the best one. Oops, my phone's ringing. Hang on. I'm just going to mute. It also, um, I was also thinking that it helps find orphans, right? Yeah. So if you're, if you're in the midst of um, doing it and you're like, no, this practice is really important, and then you don't have a purpose for it, <laughs> you have right. to go so, back and backfill So that. would inclusion be one of the purposes we should, or one of the principles we should put there and that links to what I was writing. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to back track to what the principle would be. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that the principle is inclusion and then how do we get there through practice goes in the right. pink. <laughs> it makes um, me think of, um, we have this thing that we did at one point, they called it string theory. It's not really string theory, like as in quantum mechanics string theory, but it's like, tying things together and there were big bins like this and you had to tie you had to have a string connecting everything and if you didn't have a string connecting something you had to go back and revisit and say do i need that do i need to add something to make it happen or is this really not going to be part of what i want to do yeah that makes great sense because that sort of makes the purpose aspect of this whole project like front and center like if the string is loose and there's no connection there, then it really doesn't, it, it doesn't call, it isn't calling us in purpose. And so mm -hmm. it's right. discardable. That's really interesting, actually, as a metaphor. It was that. And it was really cool because the things that had a lot of strings to them should have been, should be the centerpiece of your project. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. calls them out real clearly that way. It helps yeah. like identify like uh, like shared values and shared purpose within the yeah. community. Yeah. 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 Too bad we nice. don't have strings. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. Well, I guess we have like sticky notes that are sort of floating <laughs> around. We could draw I almost lines wonder, like that. <laughs> could you do like sticky notes like 
across like where they're linked together like they're bigger mm. and yeah. like you have them in rows and like well I'm actually it was a mosaic I'm thinking mm. that way it's just that the visualization isn't really affording that aspect of it but when I see a sticky I'm looking for another color that picks up on that sticky Mm -hmm. So if I see always be respectful, then I'm looking for how that plays out in regarding participants, so part struck. So that would be where the thread is. And so that's an uh, interesting So you thing. would say you would use the colors in a different way. Well, yeah, this is just a design issue we're talking about, right? Sure, now. you can. No, but that's, that helps really because yeah. I think color, I mean, I think, you know, columns or like visual, the way we do a visualization should have meaning and should have purpose yeah. or else we could have done it in text, right? Or you could number the threads or find another layer mm. to visualize. I guess you it. could have, I wonder, sorry, I wonder if like when you said Padlet, because Padlet has this offer, ability, yeah, exactly, to do what she's doing now. Because mm -hmm. the thing is that it could, the openness plus inclusion together could lead to one practice, right? Right. But then if we move nice. those stickies, that, that line doesn't move, so it'll get ugly. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because sometimes it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a connected piece. It's like just a free. Right. Yeah, it's like, just a free strung. True. True. Um, so that's I think okay. what I'd like to do is just sort of say, I think we need to wrap up the video itself. Uh, but we can say, so we've got something everywhere right now, but we need to go back. Can we go to the... Um, uh, the practices right now and see what might some of these practices look like like we talk about openness and inclusion what are some practices that we need to talk about and and remember the other aspect of some of the things that we looked at were not only what's acceptable what's not acceptable behavior but also how to report unacceptable behavior mm. and what are the consequences um, oh. Or remediation or hmm. like uh, well, yeah, if a student gets offended mm. or hurt or harmed in some uh, way do they, do they email you do they uh, meet you privately do you recommend that they speak directly to the other student first like what do you recommend oh oh may not necessarily i think that sometimes depending on the context depending on what's going on uh, I think a student should feel free to come to me as an instructor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if they feel like they, and, they need to come to me first, yeah. I want to be open to that. Yeah. Yep. Although perhaps you also want to tell them if they are, if they have some kind of um, mental health uh, situation mm -hmm. that if, right. if they need to go directly to their counselor. They right. should know yes. to do that, but you need to tell them that too. And yes. Or, or even say if it's about me, this is the person you should go talk to. Like we, right. we need to be very because direct and I, open yeah. about this before right. a problem happens. We need to be clear that the student themselves could be, the teacher themselves could be the person who sure. has the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do think that uh, trying to, you know, set uh, maybe an ethos of transparency and um you know a, a first stage if it's possible whatsoever to you know talk with openly about what mm -hmm. you're experiencing mm -hmm. either with the person that it that it's happening with or with yeah. me as the instructor or whatever mm -hmm. right yeah um i think that that's a i'm not sure exactly how to word it but i do think i think those are extreme cases mm -hmm. where um where you know somebody can't go to the actual person and so i i don't want to set it up that that's the norm necessarily mm -hmm. that yeah. you have to go to somebody else right yeah yeah but the the other thing is also like if they're gonna report it to me as a teacher is there an anonymous is there a form for example for reporting these kinds of things that doesn't ask you for any personally identifying information and then in that form maybe it asks them do you want me to bring this back to class or do you want me to you know yeah. like also when when someone reports something do they want what kind of action do they want the teacher to take right uh, how much you know how involved there, there's a lot of things to think about here yeah, yeah I think I'm, in the... yeah. I'm gonna stop Go sharing ahead. the screen that's no all. I was I was wondering if um since we had talked about it if there wasn't also a reflective piece mm -hmm. that could be put into mm -hmm. that of like yes. think about 
what was what happened from both your point of view and the other's point of view and try to figure out whether that i mean is, was that intentional harm mm. and if it was intentional harm then we need to follow up with the appropriate party yeah. but if it wasn't then maybe it's worth a conversation or or something along those lines and, and you can come to me and yeah. find out more yeah you know this this makes sense in certain contexts but if it's like a minority i don't want them to worry about intentionality of harm because that's what microaggression right. is it's someone right. who's yeah. being racist or whatever without intending to but they're still harming you and it doesn't matter that they didn't intend it because the consequences are that got her that's the problem so with the unintentional it. harm is that it's really easy to just keep replicating it oh it was unintentional oh it was unintentional it's like at some point yeah you need You're to intentionally <laughs> not being careful. Like it's always like when my daughter does something, she's you. like, "Oh, you know, I just I didn't notice." Oh, you need to notice. That's the point. Is yeah. that if you right. keep not noticing and this keeps happening, this is a sign that you need to start noticing and not noticing means you're being careless, right? Yeah. Well, I wasn't saying so, yeah. don't do anything about what was right. an intentional mm -hmm. harm. Oh, I but just say, try to understand from the other person's perspective right. what was happening. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then. And yeah. then figure out whether that was something that was malicious Absolutely. and then, you know, have a conversation about that or have a conversation with me or find the appropriate party to have a conversation with so that we can follow up on that. But also, you know, that kind of moment that you liked in the, the netiquette, I'm sorry, I'm using the word, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. moment that I put that was like, give people the benefit of the doubt, yeah. like. Yeah, especially with written online stuff, I think that makes sense. This is just reminding me of that guy who's trying to tell me what to say in my keynote. Like, Are you telling me what to say in my keynote? Are you telling me? Oh, obviously, I wasn't truly asking that question, but I was giving him the chance to apologize. It took me a while to realize. But anyway, <laughs> um, so anyway, so this is actually, I, I have a feeling like this exercise actually needs a lot more time than I thought. I already thought it was going to take time, but I think it's needs more time and especially if students have never done anything like this before um, so I'm, I'm wondering kind of if this is what i'm thinking right now for my class is to try to develop something and show it to them at first because i have a feeling yes. I, I can't yeah. stay like three weeks that's what i was thinking I, I think there's then, there should be some base reference point and then mm -hmm. an invitation to edit, add, um, and, you know, remix yeah. as, yeah. as the community grows. And yeah. I keep coming so back to the well, annotate the syllabus activity. Like, I think that that might yeah. be, that might be mm -hmm. a seeding activity for something like this. And then offload it to something like this after, sure. Right. And the safety considerations. The, so the, the annotated syllabus could be a way of doing it. And then reading the safety considerations that we have uh, that Kate Bowles wrote can be a yes. thing for students to think about. Because if they've never yes. thought about it, they, they don't think about these things in necessarily the way we, they don't all think about it the way we've been thinking about it for years. right? So it could sort of open I actually think that's a great suggestion is that reading mm -hmm. those safety considerations just heightens a particular kind of sensitivity and signals to others that there's a value system that needs to be extended in order to learn um, in a way where everyone feels safe. So even if not all of those um, safety considerations are completely um, synthesized and absorbed, there is this kind of signaling as to something important, um, and then it can be constantly worked through through practice in the class. Yeah, you'd either have to do that or you'd have to start with something. I'm trying to think of something kind of simple that you could start with this on, but I can't figure out what exactly that would be. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, like it, everything I could think of is complex, like, you know, how to eat a banana or something. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, not, not like something, something that kind of everyone has probably a, so you would use it for your context. Cause so if you don't eat bananas guess, wherever you are, uh, no, you but, don't, but don't but use that. Bananas, the bananas gives me an idea like purposes to lose weight. Right. And your principles are that you want to sustain weight loss. Um, you don't want to be malnourished as you lose weight, for example. And then you right. can go into 
Yeah, and actually when you think about, I'm just going through the process from it. Thank you, Rizka. So thinking about like, for example, the, the participants should be your family because they have to eat meals with you and you might eat, and maybe your friends because they need to understand when you go out or you exercise or whatever, like what to do. And then maybe the structures might entail like waking times or, or yeah. spaces or shopping yeah. time or whatever. And then you can set the things that, you know, the practices that you can do. I think that's actually one of the problems is that a lot of times people are trying to lose weight, but they're not basing it on their principles. And so it doesn't work for them. Right? It's not about why they're doing it. Yeah. But I was just thinking that, cause I don't like to decree what will happen. Mm -hmm. For the for the um, participation guidelines, I like that free form of like them mm -hmm. thinking up what they need to say, not just remixing what I've said. Yeah, right. You have to do something really simple that everyone kind of understands first, so that you could move to something more complex. Yeah. I think. Right. Did you want the because simple thing to be something related to that as well, or like a, just showing this the, the arc? Like what I thought I, you were saying was to go through the arc of it. Yeah. To go through with the arc of the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. with something that's not that significant. It, it, Ken, was, it was something that doesn't really matter, but everyone mm -hmm. kind of does. Mm -hmm. Ken, or thinks about. Say? Or examples, because some students just really are uncomfortable with that blank page. Like mm -hmm. I think Mia was saying earlier, you've got, you've got to kind of give them examples, give them something to start with, yeah. and not yeah. that fear of the blank page. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm going to stop this video for now. What I'm going to ask Thanks, you all everybody. to do, thank you. What I'm going to ask everyone to do, and we're going to ask a few other people, to give us good ideas of um, this kind of thing for classes, so that we can share in the additional resources some actual examples for class. Because the ones we shared now were not mainly for classes. So. Okay, thank you all. Bye.